We're back with Amanda Lindhout. She's a journalist, a humanitarian, a survivor. I, I'm sure you've heard that so much. Survivor, survivor. How did you survive in the end? At uh, 460 days, you know people are, are, you think people are working to get you out. I'm you hoping people. <laughs> people are working. You have made not friends with your captors, but you're familiar with them now. Certainly not friends with my captors. No. no. Terrified of yeah. your captors. Mm -hmm. But you know things about them, like the one Romeo who was doing a lot of the negotiating. He was going to go to New York to yeah. school. I know. He had applied and been accepted into graduate school in the state of New York, which is absolutely oh. terrifying. The leaders of this kidnapping were um, young men who had traveled around the world a little bit who, yeah. When you heard the words on the telephone from your mother, Amanda, you're free. Mm -hmm. Did you believe it? Freedom was hard to grasp. Freedom was hard to grasp, not only in that minute, Fanny, but for weeks afterwards. I had had the most vivid dreams of freedom when I was in captivity. And then when freedom was my reality, the nightmares that I had about captivity were equally as vivid. And then th it was a very blurry line between what was real and, and what was not. So people imagine it to be this very joyous time for me. And certainly there, there, there were many moments that were being reunited with my mother and father. But it was really challenging, as it continues to be today. The that was the beginning of recovery. And flashbacks today still. Sure, yeah. And getting better all the time. But the truth is that I, my daily reality is I'm, I carry with me the weight of that experience every single day. And it can be very hard. And what did you learn about the complexity of forgiveness, of compassion? Mm -hmm, that's a good way of putting it, the complexity, because it certainly is. It's. It's a choice that I make every day, but it doesn't mean that when I make that choice, I experience that feeling of forgiveness, but I want to forgive. That's the important thing. I choose to want it, and I want it for myself, because there are days when I, really, when I do feel that, when I do feel like I've forgiven, and what that feels like to me is freedom. And did they catch the captors? No, and in a country like Somalia that lacks an effective central government, um, it's unlikely that they ever will. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've made peace with that. My healing is not contingent on those, those young men spending the rest of their life in jail. What is it contingent on? Um, life on the other side is such a gift, and it's not without its challenges, but I feel like I've been given this second chance at, at life, and, and what has been really important to me is a being of service to others. There was a promise I had made myself in captivity about what I would do with my life if I made it out. And, and that was very much um, built around actually doing something positive to help that country where I had been abducted. Hence the Global Enrichment Foundation. Tell mm -hmm. me about it. Yeah, I launched the Global Enrichment Foundation shortly after I was released from captivity. To many people's surprise, people thought it was a strange response for me to have given how severe everything I had been through was. But I had an up close and personal look at how those decades of conflict have shaped generations of youth. And I wanted to build an organization to focus on education. So fast forward now to today, almost four years later, and the Global Enrichment Foundation has programs that have reached well over 200,000 people inside of Somalia. It's no longer just a one woman show. Mm -hmm. I've got a really wonderful team of people that support. And you work with Somali women, mm -hmm. women around the world, whom? Yeah, with Somali women. So all of our programs are either in Somalia or with Somali refugees in Kenya. And we have a really strong focus on supporting Somali women, in large part to honor the memory of the woman at the mosque, the woman who may have lost mm -hmm. her life, um, mm -hmm. who risked her life, certainly trying to save me. What was it like for you to return to Somalia? It, it wasn't easy, but I wasn't thinking of myself so much with that first trip back. That was in 2011 when there was the, the famine, and I organized lots of security and had kidnap and ransom insurance, and I had my parents' blessing to go back. Um, and I crossed that border thinking about the work I was going to do. We gave out over 2 million meals in response to the famine in Somalia that year, um, which I'm really proud of. But it was only afterwards, after I came mm. back out, that it felt like I had um, let a load off. Like I'd been, I'd let go of a lot of fear by crossing that border and going back to the place where I had lived my worst nightmare, which wasn't the motivation for me doing it, but it was something really nice that I received afterwards. Mm. Still afraid of the dark? I am still afraid of the dark, but you know what? I sleep with the lights off. I make that choice too. My life now is full of the choices 
that I need to make every day about who I want to be in relation to what happened to me. And I want to be somebody that is not afraid of the dark, that can sleep with the lights off. So I make that choice, even though right now, currently, I still am afraid of it. I understand. And, and you report the story now, not become the story. Right. The golden rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I thank you. Thank you. Thanks for doing this.